Brothers and sisters, I greet you and remind you that God's grace and peace are yours this day and forevermore. Sh shall we stand together and share in our call to worship? Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Our first scripture reading comes from Acts of the Apostles in the third chapter. Just as the ministry of the church has been empowered by the Holy Spirit, so begins the ministry of the disciples in the way in which Jesus told them would happen, that they would not just do the things that Jesus did and say, but they would do things even greater. Peter and John were going up to the temple at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the established time of prayer. Meanwhile, a man crippled since birth was being carried in. Every day, people would place him at the temple gate, known as the beautiful gate, so that he could ask for money from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he began to ask them for a gift. Now, Peter and John stared at him. Peter said, look at us. <laughs> so the man gazed at them, expecting to receive from them. But Peter said, I don't have any money, but I will give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, rise up and walk. Then he grasped the man's right hand and raised him up. And at once his feet and ankles became strong. Jumping up, he began to walk around. He entered the temple with them walking, leaping, and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the same one who used to sit at the temple's beautiful gate asking for money. They were filled with amazement and surprise at what happened to him. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thanks, thanks be, be to God. God. I was uh, some years ago... Uh, at a conference out in Oregon for, uh, uh, for rural, uh, rural work, rural ministry work. And there was a fellow there who was a folk singer. He did a lot of his own writing. Um, he was from the local area. Uh, and in the songwriting that he would do, uh, it oftentimes was around justice issues, but especially economic justice. And, uh, and he would play a lot of his songs for us with his guitar. 
But he also played other music, which was just lots of fun, especially some of the vacation Bible school music. Uh, so when we were together in the seminar, you know, we were just a bunch of um, hillbillies and hicks and backwoods kind of folks from all over the country. And, uh, and we just loved, you know, being entertained with this folksy kind of lighthearted, um, uh, especially in the worship uh, services that we would have together. Uh, and I remember a piece of music that I was introduced to that a lot of the folk told me that they had learned in Vacation Bible School, but I didn't remember singing. And it was actually inspired by this very passage of Scripture. And at one point, as you're singing the song, you know how it is with Vacation Bible School, right? There's always movement for the song. And, and you can imagine what the movement it was with this verse, right? These verses... Um, because it was about this man, <laughs> the song was, who was lame, but who now was uh, risen up by, by uh, Peter and, and John. Well, okay, so what would be the movement you would expect to hear in this song and sing to and participate in? Rise up. Okay, there, there's, there's the leaping, all right, there, you know, the idea of raising up. Uh, maybe some dance, uh, some form of dance. Well, okay, so, so, the, um, so the motions were something like, you know, leaping and walking and praising God. You know, leaping and walking and praising God. <laughs> so, so this went along with the song. Now, you have to imagine, uh, at, at, at that time, at that conference, I was still in my, in my late 20s, as I, way back when I started in ministry, and, and, and I was probably among the younger clergy uh, in the room, but we were of all ages, you know, uh, all the way up through, you know, the 70-something-year-olds who were retired and who were there. And we were all leaping <laughs> and walking and praising God. Uh, now, I know you're seated, but, but do one of them with me, you know. Will, will you? Let, let's praise God. Yeah, let's, let's praise God. There's, there's something about that movement that gets your blood going, isn't there? That, that does something for you. Well, as we, as we think about the Scripture, as we think about Jesus, as we think about life, uh, there's something about that combination, you know, just something simple as walking. We, we take that for granted, many of us, uh, until the walking doesn't work as well anymore. Uh, it's certainly the leaping <laughs> is, is something that maybe is with us for a time period of our lives, but come to a point where you don't dare do that because you might fall over, right? Uh, but the praising God piece is there forever, as long as our hearts are able to smile, even if we can't, even if we can't physically get, get our hands up much to be praising, we can sp still be lifting our, our hearts in praise. Well, the scripture reminds us uh, that, that this healing that Peter and John does isn't just something that happens on the outside, but it's something that happens both on the outside as well as on the inside. Why else would this man who is just, who is just you know, healed um, have, have the response of not just walking again or leaping in the things he hadn't been able to do, but the praising God piece along with it. A healing took place internally, externally for the whole man who used to sit at the beautiful gate begging for money. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I invite us to go to God in prayer. May the Lord be with you. Also with you. Gracious Lord, we, we give you thanks uh, for these prayers that we lift up to you as we gather together. We have called to mind um, some of our family members and friends and others in the community that we know, and, and some of them we've named aloud with one another here this morning. And some, uh, as they've been called to mind, Lord, we've just sat holding their names, holding their faces in our, in our minds, Lord, their images, uh, holding them up to you. Uh, Lord, you know our hearts, you know our minds, you know our prayers. And as we pray to you, God, we give thanks and praise that, well, that you hear all of our prayers. Uh, Lord, receive these uh, from us uh, that we might uh, receive in return from you the assurance that all things are made right in their time. So grant us, Lord, your patience. 
Uh, grant us, Lord, uh, not only the assurance uh, that things are made right, but the ability with this freedom of not worrying then without being fearful uh, that we might be much more mindful of one another, more ready to take time for each other, more ready, Lord, to slow down, check in with each other, and realize that we really are created one for another. Even the strangers among us were created for us and we for them. Uh, so, Lord, as we connect with one another in this community that we live in, now this global community that we live in, uh, may this be our sign, uh, Lord, of Christ among us, uh, that when we speak to another, Lord, we feel our hearts lifted. Uh, this in, is our prayer this day, and as we pray it, we pray, uh, Lord, together in the way that you taught us as we say the name and the prayer of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel of John in the fourth chapter. These words from the life and ministry of Jesus. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was making more disciples and baptizing more than John although Jesus' disciples were baptizing, not Jesus himself. Therefore, he left Judea and went back to Galilee. Jesus had to go through Samaria. He came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, which was near the land that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jesus was tired from his journey, so he sat down at the well. And it was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to the well to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me some water to drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy him some food. The Samaritan woman asked, Why do you, a Jewish man, ask for something to drink from me, a Samaritan woman? You see, Jews and Samaritans didn't associate with each other. But well, Jesus responded, if you recognize God's gift who is saying to you, give me some water to drink, you would be asking him and he would be giving you living water. Well, the woman said to him, sir, sir, you don't have a bucket and the well is deep. Where would you get this living water? You, you're, you're, you aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us this well and he drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Well, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water that I will give will never be thirsty again. The water that I give will become, in those who drink it, a spring of water that bubbles up to eternal life. Well, then the woman said to him, sir, 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 give me this water so that I will never be thirsty and will never need to come here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, all right, well, First go, get your husband, and come back here. Well, what then, then the woman replied, um, I don't have a husband. You are right to say I don't have a husband, Jesus answered. You've had five husbands, and the man you are with now isn't your husband, huh? You've spoken the truth. The woman said, well, sir, I, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you and your people say that it is necessary to worship in Jerusalem. 
Jesus then said to her, Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you and your people will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You and your people worship what you don't know. We worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. But the time is coming and is here when true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. The Father looks for those who worship him this way. God is spirit, and it is necessary to worship God in spirit and in truth. But then the woman said, Well, I know that the Messiah is coming, the one who is called the Christ, and when he comes, he'll teach us everything. Well, Jesus then said to her, I am. I am the one who speaks with you. And just then, Jesus' disciples arrived and were shocked that he was talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? Now the woman then put down her water jar and went into the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who, who has told me everything I've done. Could this man be the Christ? Well, they left the city and were on their way to see Jesus. In the meantime, the disciples back at the well spoke to Jesus, saying, well, Rabbi, eat. And Jesus said to them, hey, I have food to eat that you don't know about. Well, then the disciples looked at each other and, and asked, has someone brought him food? And Jesus said to them, I am fed by doing the will of the one who sent me by completing his work. Don't you have a saying, four more months and then it's time for the harvest? Look, I tell you, open your eyes and notice that the fields are already ripe for the harvest. Those who harvest are receiving their pay and gathering fruit for eternal life so that those who sow and those who harvest can celebrate together. This is a true saying that one sows and another harvests. I have sent you to the harvest what you didn't work for. Others worked hard and you will share in their hard work. Now many Samaritans in the city that was there believed in Jesus because of the woman's word when she testified, he told me everything I've done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. And then they said to the woman, well, we no longer believe because of what you said, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is truly the Savior of the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thank Thanks be to God. God. You know, it's a bit of a lengthy passage, but it's one of those um, that I don't know how many Sunday school lessons I've had over, um, over the decades about, and one that causes us to go back again and again and again. But this morning, the thought is uh, around the theme of healing. I don't, think, I don't think there's any, any one of us here would argue the case that the world doesn't need a good dose of healing just now. <laughs> COVID-19, if nothing else, right? But, you know, it's like a lot of the headlines of the news this summer has been pulling out of the woodwork. There's been a whole lot of other healing that's been needing to happen. You know, the gap between those who have and those who don't have. The gap uh, between people of certain skin colors and others of s other skin colors. The gap uh, between, um, uh, between lots of things. The gap between the injustices that, that cause people to just do crazy things because they're angry, because they've gone in want far too long because they see that some people, some parts of the world have one they could have, they should have, they want to have, they deserve to have. We've heard a lot of that this summer, have we not? I don't think anyone would argue the case that the world doesn't need a good dose of healing and not just for a virus that's floating around. As we've heard, I think, in the headlines, um, no matter whose opinion is where, there's at least one agreement that this pandemic has amplified all the little issues, or shall we say, the issues we've been able to make little, because they're really not little issues. 
the pandemic has amplified a lot of the injustices that have been not just among us as, as we live here in American society, but in all other parts of the world as well. We were having riots um, uh, and, and still have uh, in some places. Uh, certainly the protests go on, but we're having riots break out because of people's anger. Some of the riots break out because some folks who feel manipulated for far too long, it's time for them to manipulate others because that's oftentimes our response in life. When you're experiencing fire, you just throw fire, adding fire to fire. But we're not the only place in the world where this is happening. Uh, we heard of an explosion in Beirut, Lebanon. And shortly after, did you remember catching that? Protests, anger, the injustices that, you know, um, that a six-year uh, six mess, <laughs> the, story, the inappropriate storage of, of a farm chemical um, in a volatile way, um, not being taken care of, and they're naming corruption as the primary uh, factor uh, causing this to happen. A lot of brokenness in the world has been around us that needs healing. But what kind of healing? What do we want to say about healing? We know that, we know that healing is something we have to give ourselves to, right? Right? We, ha we have to want to participate in it. We have to want to be able to participate in it. And maybe you've been like one of those who've gone for a checkup at the doctor's office, and among the first things the receptionist does is checks you in, looks at your chart, uh, and verifies what you're there for, and, and, and in some of those cases, they'll give you one of these plastic uh, vial things, and then maybe tell you, um, uh, there's, a, there's a bathroom over in the corner. You can use, you can use it and, uh, and, and just bring it back to me. Well, we have to willingly want to participate in all that, right? You could be like the fellow who went into the bathroom and then came out and then have handed the receptionist back the empty vial saying, oh, there was a toilet in there. I guess I didn't need it after all, right? We have to want to participate in our healing. We have to want to recognize that sometimes the world needs healing and we've actually been part of the problem. And that even makes it harder to want to participate in our own healing. For some of us, that may mean that we've been the benefactors of privileges. And we've heard that talked about some this summer, that certain people groups have been benefactors of certain privileges that have not been available to other people groups. And so to participate in the healing of the world means confessing to that, recognizing that we've been part of the problem. The next thing that it seems to me that is involved in healing is that it's not, it's not something that we can, it's not something that we can, if you will, especially with our modern age, uh, hold healing, the whole concept of healing, in some kind of a superstitious cloud anymore. For not for the last couple of hundred years have we been able to do this. Um, and in fact, actually, uh, up until probably the 19, late 1950s, maybe the 1960s, the whole concept of spiritual healing or faith healing was all but stamped out by the scientific mind. You know, you got to be able to prove this stuff works. But beginning in the 1960s, and certainly through the 70s and 80s and 90s and, and, and today, there's been a resurgence. There's been a resurgence of the recognition of spiritual healing, of faith healing. Um, now, that's, that's for people like me to be able to say, you know, these miracles that the Scripture des describes, I have absolute faith um, that Peter and John came by a gate one day on their way to the temple, and there was a fellow there that had, you know, been crippled <laughs> his life. And, and I have no doubt um, that Peter and John didn't have much because those early Christians were devout on sharing what they had with each other. Uh, and, and you didn't have any more than what you needed for the day. So I have no doubt they had no extra. Um, and I also have no doubt that in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, they raised the fellow up. 
But you know, our modern scientific minds won't accept that. How does that work? Prove that, we say. And, and not just prove it once, but you've got to prove that it can happen again and again and again and again and again. And by the time we got, by the time we got into the 1960s, part of the exodus, I think, of what was happening with churches beginning to empty out is the scientific mind said, all that religious stuff doesn't matter to much. You can't prove it. It's a bunch of bunk anyway. So what is this healing stuff then? What do we do with it? What do we do with it? Well, uh, maybe it's a bit like the doctor who tells me that he's got a particular patient that comes in. And, and she's an older lady and uh, has kind of a dry sense of humor. And one day as she's uh, being examined, um, you know, a checkup, she's had some aches and pains that are a little bit new and, and, and you know, gotten to a point where it's disrupting her sleep. And so she comes in and, and he's uh, you know, checking her over and trying to figure out what's going on. And, and in the middle of their exam, she's looking at him and she says, you know, you kind of remind me of my third husband. And he says, oh, third husband? Well, how, many, how many have you had? He didn't remember the chart saying anything about that. And she says, oh, just two. Well, now think about that one. <laughs> what's, what's wrong with the one she's got that she's now, well, anyway, never mind. But the point is that sometimes, you know, sometimes the, the, this, this, this healing has this mystery, this false nature around it, you know, that something can't be true. And, and, yet, and yet we know that we know that, especially since the 1960s, with this resurgence of spiritual healing, with this resurgence of interest in faith healing, we know that even though science can continue to do test after test after test, scientific research study after research study, they still can't show that a certain kind of prayer or a certain kind of effort or a certain kind of hands-on energy exchange or any of that ever does anything to the human body. Not at all. But, but, but this, this interest hasn't gone away. We've created homeopathic doctors. We've created, well, chiropractic care, which finally has gotten you know, recognition by insurance companies, right? Um, where it started out as hocus pocus. You straighten up the body and you can rid yourself of cancer or something. Now, a lot of people don't remember that, but a lot of the medical doctors will tell you <laughs> this chiropractic stuff, <laughs> that was you know, witch doctory stuff. But that's where we've come from, and, and so what's happening? What's, what's the shift that's going on in our modern sense of healing? And how do we participate in it or not as, as Christians? Because we agree that the world needs a good dose of healing. Well, all right. We, we need to know, I suppose, how healing works. Because if we don't understand it, if we don't... If we, don't, if we can't figure it out, we might really go off the wrong path. It, it's like the lady that comes home from the doctor uh, with the medication, takes the medication, goes back for a follow-up exam, and, and as she does, she's telling the doctor, well, my, you know, the earache that I had, it's, you know, the, the, it's, 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 you know, it's really clearing up. I don't have the troubles anymore. Uh, but, you know, the, the stuff you gave me tastes so terribly awful. And, and the doctor didn't have the heart to tell her that, that, well, you know, um, eardrops are not supposed to be tasted. <laughs> we have to know about, you know, medical healing and, and a little bit about its happening. What we maybe don't know, maybe what we don't understand, um, or at least give enough thought to, is in the shift that's been happening in where healing is in our understanding both within the life of the church and in the medical field, is the coming together of the two has more to do with um, quality than it does quantity. I mean, think about that. Uh, Kristen, if you'll help me, throw up the next image, please. Uh, think about those two words, this idea of quality versus quantity. What really sets us free to live? Is it hanging on to every single breath we can squeeze out of life? About, you know, is it about quantity? Or is it about quality of living? And as modern science, which really doesn't understand this faith healing stuff, 
this spiritual healing stuff. As modern science can't wrap its head around it, no research can prove that it does anything. Still, in the language of science, still there's this whole field that they can't figure out, and it's called the placebo effect. Now, you've heard of that, right? <laughs> they give medicines, right? which really are not medicines, it's maybe just sterile water or something, and, and people just somehow get a little better. Well, what is that? Well, what, what, what about the human mind? What about the human spirit that is so terribly powerful that you can give a blank, if you will, <laughs> to a human person who takes it and they get better? there's not much understanding to what, what that's all about, except that somehow there must be something to this, this, this faith healing, this, this spiritual healing, but you can't quantify it. You can't measure it. You, you can't repeat it. It's oftentimes far too unique. But it has something to do with the recognition that somehow faith healing, spiritual healing, involves a quality of living instead of a quantity of living. Uh, people who participate in religious practices are far quicker, for example, to accept the news of maybe it's time for hospice care or palliative care. Maybe it's time to finally let go of all the rescue efforts and just live out the days uh, as best we can w under whatever conditions we, that may be facing us. Uh, this much has been proven. Is, is that, and the, and the med medical science understands this, that for whatever reason, people who have regular uh, religious practices and have had for a period of time tend to accept those options quicker than those who don't. So, so that it's somehow this, this religious practice, this, this being in touch with spirit and this being in touch with, with what it means to be healed may have nothing or little to do with the condition of the body to squeeze out one more day of life, but may have everything to do with living this day as well as God will enable us to do with the people around us whom we love or whom loves us. Healing has something to do with, has something to do with finding, finding where we hurt, and it's not always our bodies, but oftentimes our hearts with finding where we hurt, uh, so, that, so that both body, mind, and soul, in, in, our, in our effort to live every day wholly, can be, can be lived fully. I mean, you, you gotta know where you hurt, right? <laughs> it's like the guy who went in and he, he'd, taken, he'd taken a fall at the grocery and he went in because his, uh, you know, the bruise got big on his, on his um, uh, on the upper part of his leg and his hip, and, and he got kind of concerned about it. So he went into the emergency room, thought maybe after a couple of days, you know, maybe there was a fracture there or something. And so anyway, he was, he was explaining how, to the emergency doctor, how he had taken this fall. It was still hurting and bruised. And, and the doctor says, well, okay, um, uh, you know, w w where did you fall? You know, he's, he, you got to know where to x-ray, right? And the guy says, an aisle six. We got to know where we're hurting. We got to get on the same page together. And sometimes it's not just about body function, where we're hurting, it's in our hearts. This is why we've seen the world explode in this time of pandemic. The places where we're hurting have been hurting for a long time. And we've covered up the hurt. We've masked over the hurt. We've said the hurt isn't real. But it is. And when it hasn't been given the opportunity to be healed, wow, it just takes over. We probably all have had headaches, right? Have you ever tried to sit there and concentrate on your headache and make it go away? Let me ask, what does that usually do for you? Come on. My head doesn't hurt. My head doesn't hurt. My head doesn't hurt, you know? No, no one's ever taken that approach? Because I hate taking those little pills. And I'm one who, from time to time, if I'm not careful, if I don't take care of my body, I get migraines. They'll wipe me out for two or three days. But have you ever, have you ever maybe I'm the only nut here. You're, you've not actually just kind of found yourself focusing on the headache? And when you focus on it, what happens? Doesn't it get worse? 
We can't just focus on our pain. We're invited to focus on our healing. When Jesus has this encounter with a woman at the well, okay, we're told it's in the middle of the day. You've maybe had the Sunday school lessons like I have. We're told it's in the middle of the day, uh, you know, which is our first clue that something, something with this gal's uh, uh, you know, schedule that day was really off. Either things didn't go well at home at all, uh, because getting water, <laughs> right, a heavy chore, is something you do early in the morning before it gets warm in the, in the middle of the day. So, so just being there in the middle of the day uh, ought to be Jesus' first clue that something's not right at home. And as he engages there in conversation, she's kind of testing him, right? Because he's clearly dressed uh, in a way that kind of lets her know that he's, he's, from, uh, uh, he, you know, he's from Galilee, <laughs> which means he's probably Jewish, she's Samaritan, you know. They had dress codes, a little bit differences in cultures uh, even then, so you could tell by the way somebody was dressed where they were from, maybe a little bit difference in their accent. But, but there he is asking for her to do something that no other good Jew would do to get, her, to get him a, a drink of water. So, so there starts a whole conversation then in which Jesus perceives, maybe in the very beginning, that something in her world just isn't right and is in the need of healing. And by the time they come to the end of the conversation, her water jar was still left at the well. Did you notice that? And she's got a whole new vocation. She's got a whole new outlook on life. Could it be? Could it be? Is this the one that we've been waiting for? Is this potentially the Christ that will set all things right and let me translate in between the lines here, is this the one who will come to bring wholeness finally to all the brokenness? And we know he and she had that conversation about her brokenness, right? Okay, you want some of this living water? <laughs> Go get your husband. Uh, well. <laughs> to live life fully in these days to be healed is going to take both not just a physical world, but a spiritual world, an internal world. For the healing has to take place not just on the outside, but on the inside. Not for the quantity of life, but for the quality of life. And we can't offer quality of life to just w one group of people or another, as if somehow God didn't create us all as human beings in God's image. But we're mindful that all the brokenness created by these divisions we make are in need of healing because we're not yet living the way God invited us to live. This is why I'm convinced that all it took was for a broken heart to return to a village all excited. Could it be? And that was enough to cause some people, regardless of her reputation, Regardless of, well, I wouldn't give her the time of day. Regardless of whatever, you know, whatever stamina or status that she had uh, in the community, it was enough with her energy, with, with a look on her face, for people to go out and meet this one seated at the well. May we find healing in this time and maybe find ourselves as Jesus' healers, taking the time to be with each other. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Checking in with those whom, um, who are lonely and find themselves isolated, but not limiting that to just the ones we know, but maybe taking this time, finding a new way to learn about the life of somebody we've not known, but maybe we've seen around. For life is too short not to find the gifts that are still waiting for us in every relationship, be they one we've always known, or be they one like the encounter between Jesus and the woman at the well, a stranger along the way on a single day. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we give you thanks this day for your presence with us. We know, Lord, that you, we know that you long for your world to be healed. And yet there is so much, Lord, that, that keeps us from participating in the healing. First of all, we, we, limit, we limit 
the, uh, the, the need for healing by not recognizing the brokenness that's not just physically present in the world, but the brokenness of hearts laying around everywhere. Lord, open our eyes. Enable us to see, maybe not in the full capacity that you see, for we probably couldn't handle that, but enable us to see enough of the brokenness in the world around us that we would not just be discouraged because that could be our response. But instead, Lord, might we be looking for the Christ? Might we be looking for uh, the one whom you've sent um, already uh, to bring healing to the world? Might we be looking for the possibility that it is our hearts, our hands, our minds, the living of our lives, Lord, that given to you <laughs> might be the very healing presence for those around us? Lord God, we thank you for the invitation, the invitation to be your healing presence, the invitation to be Christ to the world, the invitation for the world, Lord, uh, to receive the healing good news of Jesus Christ, th that we might see and begin to know that coming through such a time as this that we're living, Lord, uh, that the world indeed might come closer uh, to looking fully like your kingdom and not the kingdom of the one who tempts us, not the kingdom of the one who causes us, Lord, uh, to turn upon you and one another. But, Lord, truly, we might be the kingdom of Jesus Christ. This is our prayer. Amen. If I can invite us to stand and sing together our closing hymn, A Charge to Keep I Have. A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save. Brothers and sisters, as we leave this place, following the light of Christ into the world, may you go with your hands and hearts, uh, giving them to the healing ministries that are before you. Uh, yeah, we're all called there, as much as we're called in Christ, to live in his life as he lives in ours. Amen. <laughs>